Disney, to some, is a money-hungry conglomerate that is dedicated to price gouging the general population by using nostalgia as a weapon. To others, it's their childhood and the first media that they watched that catered to them directly, making shows, parks, and even merchandise into places of their childhood that they couldn't possibly bear to pass up. And to others still, it's just the name of a company who makes movies and runs the most successful theme parks of all time. Nothing more, nothing less. Regardless of what you think of Disney as a whole, you most likely don't associate Disney with murder, suicide, abuse, and death. Especially because their executives have paid a lot of money to make sure any stories about these subjects are pushed down. Why else do you think you never hear about the murders that have occurred in Disney parks? How many times people have taken their own lives in hotels, and the various attacks that have happened at the parks worldwide? How do those incredibly newsworthy situations seem to fly under the radar? Disney is supposed to be the cleanest, safest, happiest place on Earth. And if the public knew how dark their history gets, how tainted these places are, and how incredibly unsafe everyone is in them, well, the public wouldn't want to come, would they? And if they wouldn't want to come, they wouldn't bring their kids. And if they don't bring their kids, then who is going to buy the millions of dollars in merchandise they pump into the parks every day? Who are they going to cater to in order to make sure the Disney brand is synonymous with childhood and therefore never dies based simply on nostalgia alone? It's imperative that people don't know and don't learn about the darker parts of Disney's history, from the murders to the abuse. But today we're going to be doing just that, talking about the darkest day in Disney history to date. Because today, we are going to be talking about the annihilation of the Todd family, which took place in the town established by Disney just minutes away from Disney World, Celebration Florida. This will also serve as episode one of a series about Disney properties and their dark history, a series where we dive into these topics and discuss what the people at Disney don't want you to know. These are the stories that have been buried in the press, pushed down so much that they are things of myth and legend. If you are interested in this topic, and would like to know more, hit the subscribe button, the like button, and the bell icon to be notified every time we post. So let's begin. Celebration Florida, the happiest place on earth. That's the tagline for Disney parks scattered around the world. When envisioning the first park, Disneyland, Walt Disney wanted to hearken back to yesteryear, to simpler times where people were kinder and the world seemed less mean. He envisioned a world that was straight out of the movies he had grown up on, with freshly manicured lawns, white picket fences, and where everyone knew their neighbors. This notion led to the creation of Main Street USA, a portion of the parks that celebrate pure Americana and the idea of the American dream. Upon entering Disneyland, you are welcomed into this idealized version of a town square that leads to a road lined with storefronts and shops. The smell of fresh-baked goods is pumped onto the streets from hidden locations. Paid actors sit on the stoops of the shops and apartment building facades to talk kindly to passerbys, as if they were really your neighbors. There is a city hall where guest relations is located, where guests can lodge their complaints and get commemorative pins for their birthdays and there are multiple forms of transportation in the trolley, horse-drawn carriages, and more. It's a movie set come to life. The small strip of land is supposed to place park-goers into an altered state of being and let them know they have walked out of the present and into a time where the world isn't as harsh as it seems to be. There are no car accidents, there is no road rage, and when people ask how you're doing, they actually care to hear the answer. People are nicer here, and everything feels comfortable and safe. Certainly safer than an actual street in any real-life town. It's supposed to put the average person into an almost sitcom-like existence in a place of abject comfort. Because nothing bad could ever happen here, and on the off chance it does, that bad thing is immediately removed by security personnel, never to be spoken of again. The idealized version of a town was Walt's biggest dream. Beyond the fortune from the movies, and beyond creating the greatest theme park in the world, he wanted to make this, Main Street USA, into a reality. He wanted to create a town that was perfect, as lovely as it was safe just like the one he created in his theme park. However, as you are all most likely aware, he never got to do that. When Walt died on December 15th, 1966, at the age of 65, he left the company in a state of flux. He had projects in the works, like Disney World, the largest theme park undertaking any company had ever had. And without him at the helm, people floundered. So much of the Disney company had been him thinking and dreaming up ideas that seemed impossible, and then making them happen. He would walk into the Disney studios with an idea, something that no one had ever done, and tasked his employees with finding a way to make it work. His creativity was the sole driving force, and no one else in the company had any idea of what should be done after his passing. The Florida Project, also known as Disney World, was able to be finished by Walt's brother, 
Roy Disney and was a massive success. However, he too would pass the same year of a stroke, leaving the company once again in a state of flux, this time with no Disney at the wheel. For several years after, Imagineers, executives, and people in the company simply worked on projects that Disney had talked to them about before he passed. Their priority became to do the things that they knew Walt had been interested in, things that he would be passionate about, trying to recreate the magic that seemed to come effortlessly to him. Everyone at the company was looking through their notes, trying to find out what Disney would have wanted them to do why he would have wanted to do it, and how to make it work. When pitching ideas or trying to think of what projects they should work on next, the project that felt the most like Walt would usually be picked, with all the others falling to the wayside, even if other ideas were better. What would Disney do became the question on everyone's lips, and no one knew how to answer it. For years, Disney ran in the shadow of Walt's ghost, with the express idea that he would have done what was best for the company. One of the biggest projects to follow Walt's passing was the completion of Disney World, which was a smashing success. Disney had worked on the project himself before his passing. However, after it opened to rave reviews, the focus shifted on what should we do next? How can we make this better? How do we improve what Walt set in motion? What would Walt want us to do? The company mulled over the question as attendance grew at the park, but they couldn't quite make up their minds. The company already had almost 5,000 acres of land bought outside the park for some sort of possible expansion, but they didn't know what they should do with it. They questioned if they should make it into another land or make it into more hotels for the park. They wondered how to best utilize the plot of land and what they could do to both make money and keep the magic alive. Hundreds of ideas were filtered through and people arguing the pros and cons for each. But once again, when asked, what would Disney do? The idea of a Disney owned and operated town was pitched. Like Main Street USA, the town would be created with the idea of harkening back to simpler times, utilizing a concept known as urbanism, which focused on human scale designs. The emphasis would be establishing community, where people would talk to their neighbors and felt comfortable walking to and fro. The houses would be manicured with lush gardens, large porches, and beautiful trees. The homes themselves wouldn't be too gaudy. In fact, they would harken back to older designs. The trees would have speakers inside of them, stealthily hidden, so every morning, come rain or shine, the birds would sing. During the fall, dry leaves would be shipped and placed on the streets, giving the look and feel of autumn. The streets were designed to encourage residents to walk, day or night, and the town had plenty of amenities, like its own hospital, library, preschool, and more. During the winter, the town would pump out snow on the streets, which would melt quickly in the Florida heat, and they would also place an ice rink in town square, so the residents could skate to their heart's content. Celebration was Disney's attempt at Main Street USA, and gave Disney lovers the chance to practically live in a real-life Disney park, seeing as it was just six minutes away by car. It was a Disney lover's paradise, but that doesn't mean it wasn't without criticism. Criticisms surrounding the town called out how false and manufactured this place seemed. They cited movies like The Truman Show, Stepford Wives, and Edward Scissorhands as commentaries about towns such as this, focused on the idea of perfection without realizing that to be human is to be flawed, and many people found it to be more unsettling than whimsical. The idea of a company automating birds to wake its residents, dousing the residents in fake snow to simulate winter, all of it came across as sinister rather than whimsical. Despite the backlash, thousands of people moved to celebration with the hope for a truly idyllic place to live and raise their families. But just because you dress up a town to look perfect doesn't mean nothing bad will happen there. Above everything else, this was a place that was dreamt up by a man brought to life by a corporation and was meant to sell an idea back to people in the hopes that it makes them more money. The premise to live in a small town in the early 20th century, back when crime rates were low and poverty was hard to come by, was never going to work, because that simply wasn't the reality. It was all a facade meant to trick people into thinking that they could buy peace of mind. And it all came shattering down when a resident of their picturesque community killed his entire family and lived with their bodies for two weeks, January of 2019. The story of what happened to the Todd family in 2020 begins years before Celebration was even created, before Anthony was born with his father, Robert Todd. Robert Todd was a well-to-do man who worked as a teacher in Pennsylvania. He was well-liked in his community, and because of his charisma and charitable nature, people thought the world of him. He had a confidence about him that sold him to others and made him feel as if they could trust him easily. And why wouldn't you trust a man who has dedicated his life to helping special needs children? Robert's reputation in the community led him to meeting and later marrying Tony's mother, Loretta Todd. 
who went on to give him beautiful, healthy children. Loretta loved her husband and their children, and when Robert talked about going back to school in order to further his education and gain more money-making opportunities for the family, Loretta supported him without question, taking care of the children without a second thought. Loretta was more than happy to support whatever endeavors he wanted to pursue, and felt honored at the idea that he wanted to make their already lovely life better. Unbeknownst to her, though, Robert wasn't actually going back to school and taking night classes. He was secretly living a double life, one he wanted desperately to become his regular life. At some point, Robert, approaching middle age with his wife and children, had met a 17-year-old nurse. She was young and vibrant, and Robert was immediately taken with her. She was carefree given that she was a teenager and not an adult. When he was with her, he didn't have to worry about his kids, he didn't have to worry about bills, she was fun. And not like his wife, who was consistently worrying about the kids, needing money and taking care of the house while he was at work. The younger woman didn't care about those things. She was just fun and wanted to be with him. And like a lot of men his age, Robert wanted an escape. He wanted to feel young again, like he had no responsibilities. He started seeing her, leaving his wife and kids for considerable periods of time in order to be with this much younger woman, saying things like he was starting to take night classes at a local college or he was taking a short trip for work, and Loretta had no idea. This wasn't a fling or a relationship based on sexual impulse and fun, though. No. Robert grew to love his mistress, and had even gone as far to propose to her, despite the fact that he was still married. And if you were to ask anyone who knew him, the marriage that he was in was a happy one. Robert had gone so far as to meet his mistress's family and set a date for the wedding, all while his wife was at home waiting dutifully for him to return. Through the affair, Robert had grown completely dissatisfied with his wife and children, the life he had built for himself, a life that everybody around him thought was the American dream. He felt stuck, unable to do what he really wanted to do in his life, and felt as if his marriage was the thing holding him back. It was the one thing getting in the way of his happiness, and if his wife were out of the picture, he would be able to do what he really wanted to do. With that notion in the back of his mind, Robert began to wonder if he could get his wife out of the picture, which led him to deciding to hire someone to get her out of the way for him. Having worked with the young and disenfranchised people who tended to have a harder time later in life, he quickly found two people who were willing to kill his wife and he advised them of the plan he had made. On one of the nights where he was supposedly at school, when his children were sleeping, these two men would come into his family's home, they would go to his wife's bedroom, rough her up a bit, and then shoot her in the head, killing her. The plan was to make it look like a robbery gone wrong, that Loretta's presence had surprised the burglars and they had to kill her. After they had killed his wife, Robert would come back home from class, as usual, find her dead body, and then call the police. It was practically foolproof. Robert gave the men the exact location of the house and specified exactly what room Loretta would be sleeping in, and left for his class that night, as if nothing was wrong. Soon enough, his wife would be dead, that the cops would think it was a robbery gone wrong, and he could marry the teenager he had been dating. If people thought something was amiss, or thought ill of him, he would simply say he was mourning, and they'd leave him be. No one would ever suspect he was capable of this, and he'd get to marry his mistress without anyone knowing that that's who he was. No one would ever expect he was capable of this, and he'd get to marry his mistress without anyone knowing that that's who she was. However, that's not what happened, because despite being beaten and then shot in the face by the men Robert had hired, Loretta survived. She had been shot point blank in the head, but she was still alive and able to get help. Her memory was hazy and she lost her eye, however, she lived through the horrendous ordeal, with only hazy memories of two men assaulting her and knocking her out. The cops were also quick to put two and two together, and when Robert gave his alibi, that being his night class, they did their due diligence, only to find that he hadn't been taking any classes at all. After that, his double life was exposed, leading the cops to arresting him for trying to have his wife murdered. Unfortunately, Loretta wasn't the only victim of his father's attacks. Because Anthony Todd, Robert's son, woke up during the attack, he went to see what was going on, was greeted by the horrific sight of two men assaulting his mother while she was in bed. Tony recalled how these men looked and what they did, and when one saw him standing in the hallway, mortified, the man walked over, picked him up, and placed him back in his room, because they hadn't been paid to kill a child. According to Robert, this event changed Tony forever. Watching his mother almost be killed absolutely traumatized his son, and left him with emotional scars that would never be healed. He watched the men his father paid to kill his mother attacker, had to testify as to what he saw, and later watched his mom come to terms with the fact that the man she loved had done this to her. This wounded him greatly, and his father's impact on his life wouldn't truly be felt until January of 2020, when he revealed to the world how much he took after his father. 
Anthony Todd, after his father was sentenced to prison for his part in the murder for hire of his wife, became exactly like the community he would end up living in. A nice and friendly facade of the all-American dream that covers a much darker, dangerous truth. If you were to ask anyone who knew Tony growing up, he was simply amazing. In high school, he was described by his teachers and peers as good-natured and friendly, without a mean bone in his body. He never had any issues with anyone, and always had time to tutor and help his classmates and he was on the honor roll. He was incredibly well-mannered. Peers loved him too. So much that in his junior and senior years of high school, he was voted to be class president. He wasn't just great in school though. He was also a fantastic soccer player and went and went on to play all four years, and went on to play all four years. He seemed like the all-American boy, the kid next door who always wanted to help, worked hard and treated everyone with respect, the kid that everyone came easily to, and always wanted to do what's right. He seemed perfect and not at all like he'd been traumatized by his father's actions. At the end of his senior year, he was voted most likely to succeed by his classmates, and to everyone else around him, it would seem that that was the case. But Tony didn't do that all on his own. In high school, he met the woman who he would later marry and start his family with, Megan. And just like Tony, Megan was truly beloved by her community. Tony was a people person who was always in the spotlight, be it for sports, student government, academics, and more. But Megan was a calmer presence, someone who perfectly balanced Tony, the yin to his yang. Through interviews with their peers, it seemed that Tony was a bit more boisterous in his life, always humble bragging about his accomplishments, whereas Megan was much easier to talk to, always willing to lend an ear and help you with whatever you had going on. She was just as accomplished as Tony, equally as popular, and had a real musical talent. However, she was much more known for how she made people feel. Her peers would describe her as calming and positive, someone they would look to in times of stress. She would ease her friends' worries with a look or a smile and never ask for anything in return. Friends found her nurturing and motherly and felt like any issue they had could be resolved through talking to her. When Megan and Tony got together, everyone saw them as the perfect couple. They complimented each other very well, with Megan's quiet, calming presence offsetting Tony's more boisterous antics, and vice versa. They would communicate in a way that was unlike so many young couples, with them being open and honest with each other, trusting one another completely. Which is why, unlike many high school couples, Tony and Megan made their relationship work throughout the years, with them deciding to go to college together and later get married. In college, the couple continued their reputation for being perfect with multiple classmates citing them as being an amazing couple. One classmate in particular recalled the feeling that they had it all figured out and how calming it was to be around them, especially when they were going through their own crises. When Tony and Megan graduated, they decided to open a chiropractic clinic in Colchester, Connecticut, called Family Physical Therapy. Through this clinic, Tony gained an even greater reputation in his community than he had in high school and college. People would come to their clinic stressed after months of going to various specialists who didn't know exactly what was wrong with them spending thousands of dollars in the process, and in the span of what seemed like minutes, Tony would be able to diagnose and help them. Tony would listen to his patients in a way other doctors didn't. He'd spend time with them, working with them on whatever they were dealing with, letting them know he cared about their health and well-being, and that he was going to work with them to find out what was wrong. He provided a level of care that was above and beyond what was available in Colchester, and his patients loved him. He became sort of a local celebrity, with his clients going out of their way to repay him for his work. His clients would provide him free services, saying that if he needed anything from their shops or places of business, he'd get it for free. He was recognized when he went out with his family, with people stopping him to tell him how much he had helped them with their pain. And through word of mouth alone, family physical therapy was able to grow into a second location. Colchester is a small town, so for a small business to need two locations is a big deal. Megan was also a yoga instructor, which helped them get more clients and made her even more of a mainstay in the community. Tony and Megan were doing great with their businesses thriving and their reputations glowing in the community. And that didn't slow down when they decided to start building their family. They had three children, Alec, Tyler, and Zoe. And after the birth of Zoe in 2015, Megan decided to take a back seat to the business and become a stay-at-home mother. She wanted to homeschool the kids, utilize hands-on learning methods, and help them pursue their passions. One thing Megan was very interested in was the pursuit of the arts specifically music. Both Alec and Tyler were taught piano from a very early age and were both seen as incredibly gifted musicians. They didn't stop with piano though, as Alec was also interested in learning violin and Tyler was learning folk guitar. 
As for Zoe, she was too small to learn piano before her untimely death. However, she couldn't wait to start because she loved music. Megan was very invested in teaching her kids everything she knew and getting them out into the world. Because of how hands-on she was as a mother and what she had instilled in them, her kids were widely regarded in the community as well. Their neighbors in Connecticut would talk about how well-behaved Alec, Tyler, and Zoe were, and how the boys would go out of their way to help others, which was rare. When it would snow, Alec and Tyler would go to their neighbors' homes without provocation from their parents to ask if anyone needed sh to ask if anyone needed help shoveling the snow from their driveway. When they would see someone come home with groceries, they would run over to see if they could help bring them in for them. They were so well behaved that Megan and Tony would often get complimented for their behavior and how good they were. The family couldn't seem more perfect if they tried. Megan was a wonderful mother who gave back to the community as much as she took from it. Tony was such a well-respected person that he was treated like a local celebrity and spent his free time coaching youth soccer. Alec, Tyler, and Zoe were seen as the nicest kids in town. Everything couldn't have been going better. But that's what Tony wanted people to think. And seeing perfection was more important to Tony than anything else. Because just like the town of Celebration, Tony's entire life was a facade. A facade of perfection and happiness. A facade of the American dream. And starting in 2017, that facade would start crumbling down. The facade started to break in 2017. When, according to Tony, on a vacation to Disney World, Megan was bitten by a bug and was infected with Lyme disease. According to the CDC, Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. It is transmitted to humans through the bite of infected black-legged ticks. Typical symptoms include fever, headache, fatigue, and a skin rash. If left untreated, infection can spread to the joints, the heart, and the nervous system. However, most cases of Lyme disease can be treated successfully with a few weeks of antibiotics. According to Tony, on one of the family's multiple trips to Disney World, a place they loved, Megan had been bitten by a tick and infected. In further statements he would give, both to the police and later to his father, he would say that this case of Lyme disease was more severe than most, and that it would cause Megan to lose a significant amount of weight, and that they had sought treatment from multiple doctors, only for them to not know what to do. Megan was said to be in a tremendous deal of pain, unable to get herself out of bed, take care of the children, or really do anything, being forced to rely on Tony for practically everything. This led Tony to dedicating his life, he said, to trying to find the cure. As far as we have found, there is no proof of any of this being true. Because of Megan's diagnosis, Tony and her made the decision to move their entire family from Connecticut to Florida, more specifically, Celebration Florida. Tony stated that this decision was made solely because of Megan's faltering health and the fact that she believed that being in a warmer climate would be good for her. In testimony given by her family, they also made mention of the fact that Megan believed that having the Magic Kingdom in their backyard would be good for field trips, making homeschooling a bit easier. With that in mind, Megan and Tony made the decision to put their Connecticut home on the market and buy a smaller condo in celebration. Despite them selling their house and the entire family moving states away, Tony would continue to work in Connecticut at his two physical therapy clinics alone. He would work Tuesday through till Friday, fly to Florida Friday night, stay with his family during the weekend and then fly back to Connecticut Monday nights to work on Tuesday again. During the week while in Connecticut, he would either stay with his family or at a hotel or at times stay in his offices, sleeping on the floor of his office. To the outside world, everything still seemed fine. People thought it was an odd arrangement, especially when Tony and Megan decided to rent out a separate home alongside their condo in celebration, when during half the week, Tony would be sleeping at his workplace. But they respected Tony and Megan, so whatever queries they had, they kept to themselves. This move is said to have been good for the family, by Tony. However, there was a noticeable shift in Megan and the kids. In Colchester, Megan had been a staple in the community. She had worked as a yoga instructor, she had been active in the community, and everyone knew her as a positive, calming woman you could always count on if you needed a hand. Her kids and her were always out and about, but upon moving to Celebration, she became more reserved. Her neighbors didn't seem to see her very much, and they didn't know much about her. The same thing occurred with the boys. While they were in Connecticut, their neighbors were keen on them, stating that they were kind, and helpful, going above and beyond to help others. And when they weren't doing that, they were outside playing, making friends, and just being kids. However, their neighbors in celebration thought they were nice but didn't know them too well. They were rarely seen, didn't interact much with others, and kept to themselves, save for their classes and when they had to be around others. The move seemed to shift the family radically, and it seemed to be in a negative way. Of course, Megan could have been sick, which would account for the change in her behavior, but it seemed the entire family was affected, and no one seemed to know why. For what it's worth, Tony seemed his regular self back in Connecticut. He was still talkative and engaging, and his patients still had the utmost respect for him. He even went so far as to buy a $100,000 treadmill to do hydrotherapy for some of them, showing his willingness to go above and beyond. So whatever cracks were showing in Florida weren't present in Connecticut. 
However, that stopped being the case in 2019. People started to notice a change in Tony. Megan and the family were still in Florida, basking in the sun and living less than 10 minutes away from Disney World. However, Tony wasn't doing well. He had put on a considerable amount of weight, according to his own testimony. He had been diagnosed with diabetes, and the once confident, engaging, energetic man was now coming across as reserved and stressed. His own patients noticed the difference, with him spending less and less time with them and more time on his phone. He was no longer attentive or caring, asking them questions to get to the bottom of what was going on. He was in his own little world, it seemed, stressing about whatever was on the other end of his phone, uncaring about the person in front of him. It was so apparent that one patient called him out on his behavior, only for Tony to physically recoil and stated he is just a bit stressed and overworked. Between the two storefronts, his wife's illness, and his own diabetes diagnosis, his crazy work schedule, and the fact that he didn't have a place to live half the week, it was understandable to most that he'd been a little bit anxious. What wasn't understandable was why he'd been charging his clients for care that they hadn't gotten on days when he wasn't in the office. In April of 2019, the FBI started investigating Tony for fraud. They had been alerted to possible fraudulent activity from his business when a concerned client had reported that their insurance had been billed for months of care that they had never received, where thousands of dollars had been charged to their insurance, and this was by no means an isolated incident. Many of Tony's clients, the people who revered him and spoke about him so incredibly high, had been purposely overcharged by his clinic to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And given that everything had to be run through his patient's insurance, many people remained ignorant about the fact that he was stealing their money at all. Tony had spent the better part of his career double, sometimes triple billing his patients, stealing their money, and pocketing the rest in order to pay for his lifestyle. A lifestyle that included renting two properties right outside of Disney World, multiple vacations, multiple vacations to Disney World, multiple vacations to Disney parks, frequent flights in and out of Florida, and more. To the outside world, it just appeared that Tony was an incredibly successful man whose career allowed him to have such expensive things. But in reality, he was stealing what he could from whom he could with the hopes that no one would notice. He was living an incredibly luxurious lifestyle, one that he could by no means afford. But it was much more important to him to make people think that he was doing amazing and keep his facade up than come clean about his actions. Despite him overcharging, taking out multiple loans to continue to keep the facade up and more, Tony still didn't have enough money to get him out of the hole his business was in now. When his employees would try to cash their checks every week, they would bounce due to insufficient funds on his end. He would always blame the bank or say that there was just an error and they should try again. But it was clear to see something was very wrong. More and more of his employees started to notice how stressed and scared Tony seemed, and they knew something had to be wrong. The FBI started investigating Tony in early April 2019, and that's where they found countless cases of fraud attached to his medical practice, with him obviously charging clients after they had finished their treatment, and overcharging people for things they didn't need but that wasn't all. They also found that Tony was said to be sued by two New York investment firms who had borrowed money from him. He was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. His entire livelihood was at risk of falling apart, and more and more it seemed that the world was catching on to his fraud. Although it's unlikely he knew the FBI was investigating him from his demeanor alone, it was clear to see that he thought the jig was up, or at least close to being up, at which point he started talking to Megan about moving to Florida full-time starting a practice there, and leaving Connecticut in the dust. However, those conversations never went any further because in early December of 2019, the FBI showed up at Tony's family physical therapy practice looking for evidence and to speak to Tony. At first, when the FBI questioned Tony, he played dumb and tried to deny any responsibility. He maintained his innocence and spoke about how this was probably just a mistake, something that in a week or so they could laugh at over a beer. He hadn't meant to charge that customer so many times, it was probably a processing error, there was no way he'd defraud his customers. He was Tony Todd, the Tony Todd, he wouldn't do that. However, as the interrogation continued, and Tony was made aware of just how long the FBI had been investigating, and just how much they knew, Tony admitted that he'd knowingly and willingly done everything they had accused him of. He had knowingly charged his patients for appointments they had never went to, he had charged them for services they never needed, and he had been charging their insurance providers with the hopes that they would never notice. The FBI asked him point blank how this all began, and Tony stated that he had done it because it had been easier to overcharge to make up for his debts than to properly properly earn the money. And when asked if he had been living above his means, Tony agreed. During this interrogation, Tony maintained that he acted alone in this, that his employees didn't know anything about what he had done, and, most importantly, his wife had no idea that this was going on, which made sense seeing as she had been living in Florida for two years at this point and hadn't been with the company since her daughter was born. Her somehow being in charge of processing appointments, handling the money, or even aware of any of this was incredibly unlikely, if not impossible. Tony admitted to the FBI what he had done and told them that he was going to be taking the rest of December off for the holiday season. He was also very 
straightforward with them and told them that he was spending the season in Florida. Because of the fact that Tony's family was in Florida, he had ties to the community and didn't appear to be a flight risk. The FBI stated that they would follow up with him after the holiday when he was back in town and made plans with him as to when that would be, at which point they left. Tony tried to play off the FBI raid as being a misunderstanding to his staff and the patients that were present, that this was something that would easily be cleared up, but according to the people who were there, he seemed out of sorts. He was pale, shaken, and seemed completely out of his wits, and his employees were hardly comforted, and his employees were hardly comforted when he told them that he'd get it taken care of. Some had put together that this had something to do with money and their paychecks, but they had no way of knowing just how much. The facade of Tony had fully cracked, and though the majority of people didn't know, that day, when Tony stood in front of his employees and clients, pale, shaking, stating that the FBI had raided his office over a misunderstanding, and that everything would be okay, people saw the real him. No longer confident and caring, but weak, scared, and unsure of what to do. Tony had been found out for the first time in his life, and he knew it. After the FBI left his office, Tony was out of the door. His lies had caught up to him, and he was quick to make his getaway. And that would be the last time any of his employees, family, or friends would see Tony. For the first time since they had moved in 2017, Tony and Megan made the decision to stay in Florida for Christmas. Because of the beautiful winter in Connecticut and the fact that they both had family near, they had always made the trip up to Colchester during the winter. But surprisingly, in 2019, they opted to stay in Florida. A couple of reasons were given for this, both by Tony and alleged by Megan. According to them, Megan was seemingly too sick to travel and they wanted to stay in Florida because she wanted to use their surroundings, specifically one location, in her curriculum for their homeschooling. The later reason directly went against the first reason, but neither was really the truth. According to multiple sources, Megan had also had a slight falling out with her mother as well, so many thought the reason they weren't going to be venturing back had something to do with that. Regardless, their plans were to stay in Florida, and at some point in the new year, travel up to Connecticut to visit their relatives. However, after Tony left that night, things seemed to take a turn. After Tony had arrived in Florida, Megan sent a text to their family, stating that the entire family had come down with the flu and were too sick to talk on the phone. Megan seemed to emphasize this fact, and no one would be able to talk to them, save for text, even on the holidays. Their extended family was concerned, of course, because an entire family being too sick to even call and say Merry Christmas was concerning. However, they weren't aware of the true horror that had befallen their relatives. A week before Christmas, Tony texted the family again, stating that Megan and the kids and himself would be going, quote, off the grid and turning off their phones for the time being, meaning that absolutely no other members of the family would be able to contact them. He also stated that Megan had already lost her phone, so they wouldn't be able to talk to anyone, with an exception of himself. Again, this was concerning to the extended family, but they didn't know what to think at this point. As time went on, Chrissy, Tony's sister, became exceedingly concerned about the family. The last time they heard from Megan, or who they assumed was Megan, she had stated that they were all too sick to talk, that the entire family was so ill that they wouldn't be able to even speak to anyone else, and how her brother was saying that they were going to go off the grid and would not be able to talk to anyone for a while. This was not normal behavior, and she had been concerned about her brother for a while. On December 29th, four days after Christmas, and 13 days after she got the text from Tony, Chrissy called the local sheriff's department in Florida, asking them to do a welfare check on the family. She was concerned something was wrong with them, and advised them of the odd circumstance, specifically that they had said that they were very sick, and she was scared something had happened to them. The sheriff went out to the home, but found nothing out of place, and the home seemingly empty. They knocked on the door, announced themselves, walked around the perimeter, but sensed no movement in the home, saw unopened mail on the porch, and seeing as they had no reason to expect foul play, left the home. This was not the helpful update that Chrissy had wanted. However, she remembered that the home was one of two properties that her brother and Megan had owned, so she called back to the police, asking them to check on their condo as well. Just like before, the cops went out to the Paradise condo, knocked on the door, waited, sensing no movement, and seeing no signs of foul play, left again, stating that they saw nothing out of the ordinary. Something seemed to miss. Everything was locked and secured, and seeing as it was against the law to enter a home without probable cause, they left. The cops did their best to calm Chrissy down. From her own account of the situation, her brother and his family usually traveled during the holidays. Them not being home made sense, and they themselves had stated that they didn't want to be contacted. They tried to assure her that this was much more likely that they were just away for the holidays and would be back soon, given the state of the house. Eight days later, Chrissy received a text from her brother's phone, only it wasn't her brother who sent it. Her brother's phone was found in a Starbucks in Sarasota, Florida, by an unknown stranger. This stranger was able to unlock it, and upon seeing the messages from Chrissy, reached out to see if they could give it back to the person who it belonged to. At the same time this was happening, a neighbor of Tony's reached out to Chrissy, telling her that there was now an eviction notice on the family's door. Chrissy tried to get in contact with the family once more, but was met with radio silence. Then she got another disturbing call, this time from the FBI. 
Tony had told the FBI that he would be back after Christmas, late December, early January, with his lawyer to discuss what he had done, while Tony later said he thought he'd gotten off with a slap on the wrist, and said as much to the people in his life. He was actually looking at two years in federal prison, and was made aware of that by the FBI in his initial interrogation. However, it was January, and they hadn't been able to contact Tony. His business still had signs on the window stating he would be back in the new year. His employees had no idea where he was, and they were growing more and more concerned. As time went on, and the FBI couldn't get a hold of Tony, they started to worry that he had possibly fled the country in order to try and get away with his crimes. And they had started to reach out to his family and friends to see if they knew where he was. However, Tony hadn't spoken to any of them about the FBI. The people in his office that day knew, but otherwise, his family, his friends, the people who were closest to him, had no idea how deeply in trouble Tony was. Upon hearing it, suddenly the text from Tony stating his family and him were going off the grid, that they were all too sick to call and wouldn't be seeing them for a while, those messages had a darker undertone. Chrissy was shocked to hear from the FBI, and upon hanging up the phone, started calling her family and their friends to try and figure out where Tony is, and when people had spoken to the family last. She stressed the importance of talking to the family, not just Tony, and not just text messages, and as she continued to talk to Tony's friends and family, she was met with the horrifying reality that no one had spoken to Tony since December 28th. Chrissy, once again fearing the worst for her family, reached out to the police in Florida asking them to do another welfare check on them. This time she let them know that Tony was under investigation by the FBI, the kids and mom had been sick, and that no one had heard from them since the 28th. And just like before, the cops went to the home again, only to find it just like before, completely quiet, no sign of life, and no probable cause to enter. The eviction sign was still on the door, unmoved. The mail was still on the ground, untouched, and it seemed as if there was no movement inside the house whatsoever. It seemed impossible for there to be people inside, with how quiet and dark it was, and so the police stated as much to Chrissy. Chrissy called back the next three days, January 10th, 11th, and 12th, and still the cops said the same thing. There's no one home, they are probably on vacation, this wasn't until the 13th that any progress was made. On January 13th, three FBI agents traveled from Connecticut to Florida in order to apprehend Tony. They had a warrant out for his arrest and immediately went to his home in celebration, where they planned to stake out the house until they could positively ID that Tony was in the house. They didn't have to wait long, though, because early that morning, Tony shambled out of his home, walking slowly, shaking with every step, and sat on his porch. He sat outside for a good while before standing up and walking back inside, but the agents got a good enough look at him to confirm that it was their man, alive and well, and that's all they needed to take him in. The agents then called for backup, requesting some officers come to the house just in case there was a struggle. When two other officers arrived, they made their way up to the door the same way the police had come the past three days, and knocked, announcing themselves, and waiting for a reply. And just like before, they were met with silence. It seemed like no one was there and the house was empty or abandoned, and had they not seen Tony that morning, they would have left. Left, but they knocked again, announcing themselves once more, and stated that they were going to be coming in. The agents unlocked the door themselves, having previously gotten the key from Tony's landlord, and walked in, only immediately to be greeted by the scent of decomposition. The home was dark, with the windows completely shut and the blinds drawn. The home looked dreary, and so unlike the dreamy space Disney had designed it to be. After they had entered the home, they saw a dark figure at the top of the stairs, shambling down, muttering incoherently to themselves. The agents quickly recognized this to be Tony, and asked him where the kids were. Tony, still rambling to himself, stated he didn't know where they were, probably at a friend's house, and when asked where Megan was, he shattered up the stairs as if to alert her that they had company. He let them know she was sleeping in the master bedroom upstairs and would probably be down in a moment. Amidst all of that, Tony also stated that the cops should not help him to get down the stairs, despite his shaking, because if they were to touch him, he would fall. After he got to the bottom of the stairs, he was apprehended by one of the officers. Meanwhile, the agents walked up the stairs towards the room where he stated Megan had been in, and that's where they found the family. The first thing they saw was a pair of feet, coming out from under a pile of blankets on the bed, already decomposing. It was Megan. She had been just where Tony had said, in bed but not sleeping. On the floor on a mattress next to her were the two boys, Alec and Tyler, under blankets, holding crucifixes against their chest. On the ground was their dog, Breezy, and on the bed, near the mother's feet, lay the already decomposed body of Zoe, their four-year-old daughter. Zoe had decomposed so much that upon the initial search of the home, they were unable to find her body. They thought that Tony had hidden it or placed it away from the rest of the family. However, she had been placed near the mother's feet and had been missed, due to how little of her was remaining. The family had died before Christmas, upwards of two weeks before the arrest, and Tony had lived with their bodies, lived with his family dead and decomposing, the entire time. He hadn't left the house, he hadn't gone out after killing them, or tried to flee. He simply killed them and stayed there, living with their dead bodies as if nothing had happened. 
After they had found the bodies of Tony's entire family, Tony admitted to the cops that he had taken a large amount of Benadryl in order to kill himself. He stated he wanted to be with his family in the afterlife, and he had been hoping that by the time the police found him, he would be gone. Because of that admission, instead of taking Tony straight to jail, he was instead taken to the hospital to make sure that his attempt on his own life didn't work. It was at the hospital that he admitted to killing his family, and went into detail as to how he did it. It was also found the amount of Benadryl he had taken wasn't a lethal dose, which led the police to doubt that the attempt on his own life had been real, especially given the amount of drugs he had given his sons before their deaths. While with the police in the hospital, Tony stated that Megan and him had been planning for months to kill their children, that they both planned on killing the children and then themselves in a suicide pact. This was because they wanted to be with their children in the afterlife, and because, Tony claimed, Megan had become very spiritual the last few months of her life, and thought the end of the world was coming. He stated that he had stabbed his two sons, Alec and Tyler, and suffocated his daughter Zoe. After he had killed their children, he claimed that his wife then stabbed herself in the stomach but didn't die. She then took an unhealthy amount of Tylenol PM, laid on the bed, at which she told Tony to smother her, which he did directly after. He also stated that he killed the children in separate rooms and had moved them into the master bedroom after they had gotten out of rigor. He then staged their bodies next to each other in the way that he planned to do with Megan while she was still alive. He then attempted to kill himself, but didn't succeed. However, none of this accounts for the weeks he spent inside the home with the bodies. His recollection of events and how his family died does match up with what happened according to the autopsies done on his family. However, because of the severe decomposition, it could only be determined that Zoe was killed of homicidal violence. The specific specifics of which are not known. Megan, Tyler, and Alec had all been stabbed in their stomachs and found to have Benadryl in their system, with Alec, the oldest, having the smallest amount in his. While we don't know why this occurred, it is widely speculated that Alec was the first person that Tony attacked with the intention to kill and was able to fight back, which can be seen in the defensive wounds on Tony's hands and body. In his final moments, he scratched and clawed at his dad, but was overpowered. After he passed, it is thought that Tony had the remainder of the family take Benadryl to make the killings easier for him. That is simply speculation but given the evidence left on Tony, the lack of Benadryl in his eldest son's system, it's what most believed happened. After Tony was released from the hospital and placed in jail to await his trial, Tony recanted his admission, stating that he had no longer had any memory of what he had done, and that he was not of sound body or mind when he had been questioned originally. Despite the fact that he knew things that only the killer would have known, the fact that he lived with his family's dead bodies for so long that they started to decompose around him, he was now claiming his own innocence, stating Megan had killed the children and then herself, and that he had been in a fugue state after, completely traumatized. Tony stated his initial confession was made while he was under duress, directly after a suicide attempt, and that he essentially had no idea what he was talking about. He then went further to claim that he had no idea and absolutely no memory of what had happened between when he arrived in Florida to the week after he entered prison. He has gone back and forth on this statement, saying he has no memory of certain events, then going to talk about them in extreme detail. Tony has continued to make various statements like this one to various people, all of which negate previous statements, or build upon them, but it's unclear of what really happened. According to one of Tony's statements, Megan asked him to go to their condo to retrieve a necklace for Zoe. He went over to the condo, however, he forgot his key, and rather than return to the house to retrieve it, he stayed at the condo for upwards of two hours looking for it. He then went back home, where Megan was presumably killing the children, and got a crowbar. He then returned to the condo, used the crowbar to open the door, and spent the next couple of hours looking in earnest for the Mickey Mouse necklace. He couldn't find it, but was so exhausted from his search that he accidentally fell asleep at the condo, only to wake up the next morning and return home. When Tony returned home, he found that Megan had killed the children, using what he classified as Benadryl pudding pie. She had killed the kids and told Tony that she was going to be killing herself as well. Instead of calling the police to try and get his family any medical attention, Tony stated that he couldn't because she had hidden all the phones and didn't want to abandon her while she was passing. While he was looking for a phone to get help, he stated he heard Megan stab herself in the stomach. However, this didn't kill her. She instead walked around the house doing various things before stabbing herself once more and asking Tony to smother her to death. Tony Tony stated that she had put a pillow in his hand and tried to force him to press it down on her face, hard enough that she died. He couldn't do it. According to him, she mocked him for it, before she finally died. This statement cannot be true, given that when the police had gone to the condo to do a welfare check on the family, they found no signs of a break-in and nothing to give them probable cause to think anything was wrong. If Tony had entered the condo the way he said that he did, using a crowbar instead of a key, there would be damage to the door and evidence of a break-in, leading the cops to enter. However, we know this wasn't the case. It also cannot be true because later, when Tony was in prison, a family member went to the condo in order to pack some of 
the family's things, and they found the necklace, and it was exactly where Tony stated he had looked, meaning that it was unlikely he had looked for it at all. It also is unlikely to be true because medicines like Benadryl lose their potency and effectiveness when they are put at any extreme temperatures. So if Megan were to bake Benadryl into a pie, the way Tony stated, that would require it be put in an oven at extreme temperatures. And if it was a pudding pie, that requires it then be refrigerated in extreme cold, meaning the effectiveness of this poison pie would be extremely weak. The story also doesn't account for the reason why Tony had defensive marks all over his hands and neck, presumably from killing his eldest son. Tony then changed the story again to state that he had gone to the condo and simply fallen asleep in the car outside due to his own exhaustion from having to take care of Megan. In the run-up to the trial, there have only been two further statements given by Tony himself, one in the form of a phone call he had with his sister, Chrissy, and a letter sent to his father, Robert. In order to show how his statements conflict and how what he said happened has changed, we will be going over both. First, with the phone call. This is more in line with statements that Tony has previously given. However, what's interesting about this call with his sister is the fact that Chrissy later went to the condo to pack up the family's belongings and was able to quickly locate the Mickey Mouse necklace that Tony had spent hours hours looking for, and she found it just where he said Megan told him it would be, making it unlikely that he had spent any time in the condo looking for it himself. Uh, also, but the night everything happened, okay, I'm going to tell you this, um, I went over because Zoe wanted her Mi Mickey silver uh, necklace for reasons uh, you'll find out later, okay? Yeah. Um, Megan had said it was in it's a jewelry box that's hanging on the back of the door of the master bedroom. Okay. In the condo. In the condo. Okay. Um, I went there after we ate dinner. Um, kind of grossed out because my son ate the leftovers of the meal that was it was a seafood dinner that I that they mistakenly gave to me and said that you can there. So he was eating tentacles and other you know what I mean? That's valid for you. But anyways I went over to the condo to get that. That was the one last thing we needed. Um, I spent about two hours over there trying to find the key. We couldn't find the key. So at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, I walked back to the garage and got the crowbar, went back to the condo and opened it up, okay? Um, I left it open because I figured if you were out, then you would have come down later and take care of it. Um, but I couldn't find the, the Mickey thing. So if you could find that, but couldn't find it in the jewelry box. I ended up falling asleep, and um, let's just leave it at that. Okay. Um, I fell asleep for. I was supposed to wake up at 11, 11:30. Didn't wake up the next morning. So if you can find that, just keep it safe. I will. I will. No idea what I told investigators uh, because I was completely stoked. I have no idea. I just know that I'll protect Megan so you can see it so there again. But I just didn't realize I was just. I do, um, I do wish that you would have talked to me a little bit more, though. And I get it, and we, you know, don't, don't get into it, but I do, I just, I love you. Yeah, I, um, I was asleep, so, and I wake up the next morning, so. Like I mentioned earlier, Tony did write a letter to his father, Robert Todd, earlier this year, explaining what happened and why he did what he did. This retelling conflicts greatly with the two other versions of events he has given. This letter had to be screened by the police and was leaked to the press in full. This letter contains Tony's newest version of events and gives better insight to the kind of man he was, which is why we're going to read it now. Pay attention to how often Tony tries to virtue signal to Robert and imply that he is a good person for not calling the police and helping his wife kill the children. Pay attention to how, even now, when he is in prison for killing his entire family, he tries to stress how much of a good father he is. Even after he has destroyed five lives, he still tries to keep his facade. Please excuse the impersonal nature of printing in this letter, but seeing as it is too painful to write legible script, it will have to do. 
I will explain later. I have recently been released off of Suicide Watch, as I was placed due to the circumstances, horrific as they were, in December of 2019, that the media and the sheriff's department here are making me out to be the next Butcher of Baghdad. Thanks to the counseling here and my sister, I am beginning to resemble the proud man I was prior to the incident, which shattered me beyond comprehensible ways. I remain in isolated, protected custody to protect me, as I am not jail material, and protect my case. I write to you in response to the letters I received from you, to correct all all the inaccuracies created and generated by the creative writing machine, the press, to sell papers, and the sheriff's department, who want to score a big win after screwing up a prior murder case that the governor of Florida had to intervene and move it out of the district, to respond to your absurd allegations in your last letter, and to offer you forgiveness. First of all, I am 10,000% innocent of all these preposterous charges, both on the state case and on the proposed Medicaid fraud case. The statements taken from me were interesting to say the least. I am writing to you in confidence. Please do not share with anyone but your wife, as I need not be shown off as a trophy again, nor do I need to contend with the results of the telephone game when it comes time to testify in a couple of months. Please do not break my confidence. Before continuing, it is important to note that despite Tony telling his father not to share the letter, it will become very clear soon enough that he knew the letter would be shared through the prison system, to the opposing side of counsel, and would be made public because of that. Him begging his father not to share the letter was a manipulation to try to seem put upon. I am ashamed to say yes, I did attempt suicide multiple times, as to my recollection. I am told this is natural given the circumstances of having the rug pull out from underneath me, and my world shattered. My wife and my children were, and still are, everything to me. I love my wife still very deeply, and it will be the hardest thing to sit there and tell everyone that it was her that did this when I was not home, and then she committed suicide in front of me. I have forgiven her, as I know she was chronically sick since 2011 to 2012, when a bug bit her in Disneyland of all places. That, with and everything else, led to her first miscarriage of Avery Nicole, borderline liver failure, drug-induced hepatitis, BLFTs were 3800, 3825, normal is 25, vogus nerve dysfunction, depression, in addition to that suffering from her father's suicide, and to my close friends in 2002 and 2003. Tachycardia would wake up with a heart rate greater than 180 beats per minute. Breathing difficulties at rest, Lyme disease, chronic pain, joint elasticity, weight loss, from 125 pounds muscularly ripped from being an internationally trained yoga teacher to barely holding up to 90 pounds, with loss of all female features, in addition to a multitude of other physical and functional deficits. We moved to Florida in our condo, originally because the sun and warmth made her feel better, and eventually permanently for that reason, and there were more homeschooling and performing arts opportunities for the boys. We sold the house in Colcaster in 2017, after just finishing a greater than $50,000 remodel that included all new furniture for the living room, dining room, kitchen, new kitchen cabinets, new counter, painting all downstairs, new lighting, finishing the basement, ripping up the grout while maintaining the kitchen tile, completing the 1,600 to 1,800 square foot two-level deck with a hot tub, and replacing the carpet stairs with engineered hardwood. I essentially did the work by myself and intermittent help from friends and help from the boys when they would fly back with me. Not even a year after the remodel, she decided we should move to Florida full-time and sell the house. Whatever she wanted, I did. I took my vows of love, honor, and obey, protect as religion and sacred. Then moved into the rental house at 2020 Reserve Place in celebration because we outgrew our condo in May of 2019, and it had a saltwater pool, which was good for her, and an office above the detached garage that we could use to transition business in Florida. We were not able to see it for what it was worth, hence I commuted every week. When I arrived in Connecticut on Tuesdays, I would work 2 to 9 treating my patients, and then in the office doing work until 12 to 1 a.m., returning Wednesday and Thursday to the office at 6 a.m., working from 6.30 to 9, and working until 1 a.m. I would stay at a hotel or mom's couch, my choice on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, or at an Airbnb, and Thursday night usually sleep in my office for a couple of hours, as my flight was between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., so I would be at home in Florida in time to pick up Zoe at preschool at 11 a.m. or various other things previous to that. I would catch sleep on the plane or wherever time permitted. It was not really healthy. I realized that, as I've seen recent newspaper pictures of me. But I did it for my family. When I was in Florida, I would treat my wife two to three times a day, usually 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., 9 p.m., 10.30 p.m., in personal training activities to tolerance in the afternoon daily, do food shopping and prepare 90% of the meals, prepare two full meals for when I left for Connecticut so my sons could warm up as necessary, take the boys to and from home school group 45 
minutes away, which sometimes delayed my departure depending on the home situation, and bring them home Tuesday afternoon prior to an evening flight. In addition, Zoe was driven to and from school Mondays and Tuesdays by me. The boys were home Wednesday through Friday, doing their homeschool work, and Meg would drive Zoe to and from school 10 minutes on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings. It was a routine I fully accepted. I loved being a husband and a father. I would attend to whatever personal need Meg needed, depending on the day. That included carrying her upstairs to bed, helping her shower, dress, doing Zoe's hair, I sucked at it, and whatever else. I embraced it. I was determined she was going to get better, and she was. Though the good days were amazing, but the bad days were even more depressing for her. We kept quiet for the most part, because that is how Meg wanted it. She was raised that way, as her mom was the town drunk. Her grandfather was a major democratic politician for 73 years, and she didn't want the same eyes on her that were on her mother for multiple ailments. I respected it. She was my wife, and I loved her. Like I said prior, I am still in love with her. Call that illogical, I don't care. We had a love between us, described best by C.S. Lewis being storge, a Greek term for family love. It takes the other three loves of the Greek language, phileo, friendship, eros, erotic, and apajo, god, to the next level. We didn't fight, rather discuss things, although much wasn't different between us as we made sure we built a foundation of trust, respect, and admiration for and with each other before we married. It was very important to both of us given our past. Her from an alcoholic mother and living in silence because of family and political reasons reasons, and mine thumbing from 1980. That left serious trust issues, nightmares, fear, and fear of people even thinking I had any infidelity issues. We didn't even make love until one week prior to our wedding, almost eight years of dating. Our relationship was very close and special. Anyways, too much information, I'm sure, but I thought you needed a better understanding of our relationship. If I was there that night, this never would have happened hence the self-blame and the self-condemnation. But because I was being selfish, I have lost everything near and dear to me. And when I leave here in a couple months, I will be leaving homeless and without clothes. I've lost 90 pounds so far. Blue Sky Realty and Celebration has formally evicted us from the rental house, where everything is including furniture, clothes, and special ties, remembrances of my family, especially with my kids. Most things can be replaced, except for the family piano, which was Meg's growing up and the boys learned on it, and Zoe was beginning to learn. It is the most treasured item to me, practically in the world but because I have been evicted, they have the right to sell everything to make up the costs. I understand my only hope is the estate sale is delayed due to the coronavirus and take possession of the material things. I doubt that will happen, but I am hoping and praying. In reference to the condo, which is furnished and has clothes there, I am facing foreclosure, as the mortgage has not been paid since December. There are some reasons the family hasn't done so, and I do not know the status of my finances, and Meg handled all of that. I hated doing financial stuff and had limited time to dedicate to it, as she loved it and had time, and took over full control in 2013 and 14, more so because of the guilt she was having from the buildup of medical bills, most were private pay. Another side note, but according to Tony's story, Meg got bit by a bug at Disney in 2017, which is why the family, minus Tony, moved there full time. However, in the last bit of the letter, he states that Meg took full control over his and his business's finances in 2013 and 14 because she loved it, and also because she felt guilty that because of her Lyme disease, the family had a plethora of medical bills. Why would Meg have felt guilty in 2013 before she was sick and felt the need to take over? Both of these statements can't be true. I had a gigantic life insurance on myself, but only a two to 300k on her. But when I get out, that will help get things right and get on my feet, I guess. It's being held hostage because of the charges against me, as I am sole beneficiary. I just hope the timing is right and everything is delayed because of the economic status due to the coronavirus. Here's hoping, I guess. I didn't okay the finances and I trusted her with that, as a team partnership. I know passwords and usernames as I set up the online account and essentially used the same throughout. Oh well, back to the explanations. I wasn't there that night because I was selfish and I wanted a wonderful day, as Meg described it, a most wonderful day. Meg woke up for the first time since March 2019, and even before, though intermittently, without any pain. Instead of treating her at 4.30 a.m., we spent time together, until Zoe came in wanting breakfast. The day was phenomenal. Meg relaxed inside for the most part, joining us outside on occasion, and I spent the day with the boys, doing everything from basketball to soccer to talking to Elsa Freeze Tag, you name it. Meg was inside watching TV, reading recipes, listening to music, resting and making snacks. It was the best I've seen her in a while especially since the miscarriage of September 2019 of Connor Michael. That was horrible to say the least. He was 8 to 10 weeks gestation. We initially found out at our ultrasound when Zoe was present to see baby Todd for the first time. The tech and radiologist 
were cold sold in their handling of it. We were supposed to have a follow up ultrasound two weeks later as there was no heartbeat heard or detected, but we lost Connor prior to that. Instead of leaving the ultrasound happy, it was worse than a funeral. The result of our love and the first weekend away was no longer. It was a happy surprise to conceive as we were not trying, but who knew a woman can double ovulate after the age of 40? Never cover that in any sex ed or medical classes. Anyway, I would ask her several times throughout the day if she needed anything and if everything was okay. And she would reply, everything is wonderful. If you get a chance, can you please fix the alarm sensor on the back door? And can you go to the condo to get Zoe's Mickey Mouse necklace? She asked and I would really appreciate it as she kept asking me for it. I told her I would go after dinner if it was okay, as I had some maintenance task there and it would be easier to do without the children. She responded, perfect, as I want everyone to go to bed early anyways because everyone is still getting over that stomach bug. I agreed and I also told her I would crash at the condo or in the office apartment above the garage. As one, I was a bull in a china closet when I was tired and I was extremely because of insomnia the night before. And two, she started to use quote unquote natural oils and air fresheners that were giving me sinus issues since Thanksgiving and I would snore or just have difficulty sleeping. I also told her I would fix the sensor one night after the boys were sleeping with Gorilla Glue because Tyler would jump up and touch them and constantly knock them off. He was my energetic and daring son. He wanted me to go skydiving with him on his 18th birthday, and I told him it would have to be on his 21st birthday, as I would need a serious drink before and after. Whereas Alec was into cars and wanted me to be his best man at his wedding. Shows the difference between them. He wanted a blue Camaro convertible as his first car, as I rented one for a weekend, but I told him I wanted to start him off with a pink Cadillac. He didn't enjoy that, but I did. Sorry, I switched to script. I hope you can read it. It was too tedious and painful. You see, when they took me into custody, they dropped me down 10 stairs, handcuffed me behind my back. Needless to say, that's why we hold on to somebody in custody, deputy. I had extreme back pain, shoulder and neck pain, and bilateral hand wrist pain. I have nerve damage in my left hand, right wrist sprain, right shoulder rotator cuff disruption, and lateral tear. Left shoulder rotator cuff problem, cervical and lumbar radiculopathy, cervical dysfunction, and daily migraines. Reminder, Tony had stated that he had no memory of what happened to his family in his previous statements, and even earlier in his letter, stated he had no memory of anything that happened from the time he came to Florida to a week when he was arrested. However, here, he is saying that when he was arrested, he was dropped down exactly 10 stairs, and that it was a deputy who did it. He is also recounting in his own words what happened, which also goes against his claims. I am limited in sitting for about 15 minutes before succumbing to pain, and standing for 15 to 20 minutes. I take Tylenol 600 milligrams when the nurses remember, but hesitate to take anything stronger. They gave me a med to help with the nerve pain so I could sleep, but that gave me freaky tales from the crypt nightmares, so they discharged it. So part of my day, I do self-physical therapy and keep daily notes. I'm a mess, but mentally healthy, and a clean bill of health for the most part, except for the orthopedic issues. My hypertension, EKG, thyroid, sugars, CK levels, and cholesterol are all normal now, and pending the results of the blood work. I should be discharged of all my remaining meds next week. I will stay on the last dose of antidepressant until until my trial, by my agreement. I am 10 to 15 pounds from my goal weight now and have the reemergence and have the reemergence of my six pack that I had playing college soccer. So in that department, all is good or improving. So before dinner, I moved the minivan to the driveway with the basketball hoop as I needed to for the maintenance. In addition, I asked the boys to load any boxes so I could dispose of them at the appropriate dumpster at the condo. I was also bringing the minivan over to the condo as to bring more stuff back to the house. After dinner, Meg warmed up leftovers and I had the protein shake. The boy said everything was set, and Meg pleaded with me to go get the necklace, as Zoe was driving her nuts about it. I drove over to the condo, literally thinking to myself about how wonderful the day was, and how my Zoe was going to light up the room with her smile when I brought her the necklace. Upon parking the van, I went to get the tools out, and they were not there. I walked back five minutes and found the boys playing basketball. I asked them what happened to the tools. They looked dumbfounded, and pointed to them at the base of the basketball hoop. They explained that the doors were locked, so they left them there. Of course, they only checked one door, the hatch. I couldn't be mad at them, as I did the same thing often to my father growing up. Instead, I chased them, wrestled with them, laughed, and tickled them. They were great boys, never needed any real discipline, as they were brought up correctly. Every once in a while, they would need to be separated, being competitive brothers, but they were wonderful to all, especially their little sister. The relationship was awesome, and she adored them in every way. The boys asked me to play basketball, and I, of course, said yes. I always remember a friend of mine doing one of those silly prom dances, like the electric slide 
on soccer opening day. And I, of course, laughed at him. What the fuck is this shit? God, this is so stupid. As he really looked foolish. He turned to me and said, kids only ask you to do things with them for a short amount of time. Then they stop and I don't want to have any regrets. I remember that daily and now I am living it. So we played for a while in spite of being exhausted and it was getting late. So I told them to go inside and I was going back to the condo with the tools. They said mom was preparing dessert and I was going to join them. I said no as I was trying to lose some weight etc. I told them to remind mommy I was going to stay at the condo or the upstairs apartment and I hugged and kissed them. After walking back to the minivan to get my keys, I sat in the driver's seat and wanted to take a small siesta. I was tired. The snooze button became my best friend until the battery of the iPod drained. I thought I had my phone but was mistaken. Meg could still find me and alert me through the Find My Phone app if she needed me, so I wasn't worried. I woke up with the morning sun and woke up in a panic, not really knowing the time, but knew I missed our 4 to 4.30 a.m. standing treatment time and was prepared to receive a scolding as I would on occasion if I forgot to do something but this would have been harsher I tried to start the minivan but it wouldn't start turns out the seat was pushed too far back for it to fully engage the brake sensor so I grabbed my tool bag and scurried back to the house fearful of being scolded I returned home put my tools in the garage, and noted our electric car was there. I entered the house to find the melted dessert and remnants of plates on the table. It was some kind of fruit pudding pie and a graham cracker crush. It looked very good, as my wife's desserts were, but smelled terrible. Turns out it was the Benadryl pudding pie. I didn't realize Tylenol PM or Benadryl liquid could freeze. I went to the bathroom downstairs to pee, newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes that is well under control now. Passing the TV that was on ESPN, talking about college football, which was normal, because Alec and I had always some sort of sporting bet. This one was about Joe Burrows from LSU going number one. I thought he would be in addition to being a Heisman winner, and he thought John Hunt from Oklahoma, Alabama, due to his resume and diversity. If I won, he had to eat a pepperoni pizza. If he won, I had to eat a seafood dish of his choosing. Not raw, but he promised there would be a lot of tentacles. He and I were buds, but he always competed against me. I followed the Yankees, so he of course had to be a Red Sox fan, etc. Sorry for the length of this letter, but I thought since Chrissy brought you into this, I guess they were looking for me, and because you contacted the Hartford court for that article, you should be told details. I would have called a press conference months ago, but I was told by my attorneys, who happen to be some of the best in the state, that this was not the appropriate way to handle the case, so I could sit and idle making a list of lawsuits when I get out. In addition, I'm writing this letter on the recommendation of the captain. I'll explain later. Anyways, I came out of the bathroom and found Meg at the top of the stairs. I ran to her ready to explain why I wasn't there, and she started tearing and smiling, saying, you are alive, they didn't get you. I was confused and saw her wearing a gray hydrowork shirt, and there was a stain on it. I asked her what was going on, if the kids reminded her where I was, where the kids were, and if everything was okay. She said the kids were fine and everything was okay, now that I was there. She led me into the bathroom and began telling me about the vision she got yesterday while meditating, telling her the end of the world was beginning with a virus attack and eventual invasion. I was captured and I was going to be killed, and she was granted salvation with the boys once their souls were released. Because she was sicker than we all realized, the vision was telling her that she would not be strong enough to survive. She had turned more and more spiritual over the past few years for guidance due to her illness. I can write a whole book on it. I didn't really believe in it, but whatever made her feel better, as long as no sacrifices, etc., I supported her. Long story short, she gave them the Benadryl Tylenol PM pie, separated them, woke up at 11.30, stabbed them, and then suffocated each one. At the news of this, I went to the bathroom and puked. I was weak. She continued to tell me what happened and wanted to pray and meditate together. I needed to see my kids. When I went in, I was horrified. It was peaceful, no sign of struggle, as she said, but I didn't believe her that there wasn't a struggle. I got a warm washcloth and wiped each of their faces, held them and cried, and wanted to make them look more comfortable by closing their mouths, eyes, and loosening their nasal passages. It was normal for me to wash their faces when they weren't well. Throughout the whole time, Meg kept checking on me, very calmly asking if I was okay while drinking something. Turns out to be the Benadryl she'd been stockpiling for a while. I would respond to her, no, you murdered our children, and she would respond, relax, I believe in what I saw, I released their souls. She was calm, collected, and with it throughout. It still amazes me to this day. She told me earlier that she had researched this for a while, in case it would happen on a website called Cora or Reddit.com. I returned to the bedroom and demanded the phones, as I did not know where they were. She claimed that she had hidden them, and not to worry but have faith. She gave me an empty family-sized liquid Benadryl to throw away in the garbage bag she had in the tub, and I took the opportunity to look for the phones. Upon going to the bedroom, I heard a horrific sound of something rubbing against a latex 
latex balloon. She had stabbed herself for the first time. I ran to her bedside, and she said, please don't leave me alone to die, as I didn't leave the kids alone to die. When I pull the knife, it will go quick. I can feel it happening now. Before I could react, the knife was pulled and thrown on the floor someplace. There was blood, a lot of blood. I begged her to let me call, and I would take responsibility, as I felt it was my fault. I'll explain. After a while, nothing happened. She had more of her drink and asked me to leave for a few minutes as I was stressing her out. With all my pleading of asking her to go for help, where the phones were, etc., I took the opportunity to look in the boys' room for the phone in their hiding spaces. I couldn't go to the neighbors because, one, I would violate the agreement I made of not leaving her alone, irrational, I know, and two, where we lived, neighbors never seemed to be home due to work or mostly snowboarding. I heard the shower turn on, toilet flush, and sink running. Somehow she was up. I returned to the bedroom. She again was pounding another family-sized liquid Benadryl and gave me an empty bottle to throw away. I took the opportunity to look for the phones again. I asked where all the Benadryl was, and she said in the linen closet, a place I never went. And I looked there also, no phones. As I went back to the bedroom, I saw Meg on the bed holding the knife still in her abdomen, saying this one is out of principle as she pushed the knife into her liver. She pulled it out and dropped it on the bed as I ran to her. I said, let me get you help. I will take all the responsibility for this. My mother, my father, sister, and your grandparents will take care of you. She responded, I have to be with my babies. Please pray my grandmother doesn't find out I killed the kids. It would kill her. Her grandmother was very, very close to me, and I knew this also, especially with the troubled family history of that side of the family. She then put my hand on a pillow, and she put it on her face and said, please help me pass. I'm in pain, ten times greater than childbirth, and I can't breathe. I said I couldn't, and she pleaded and pulled my hand to her face. I couldn't watch as she just left it there. Many moments later, she began hitting my arm, pulling it harder on her face, and then pushing it away as she was saying something. I thought she had changed her mind, but nope. She said I finally found something you suck at. I can still breathe. I told her I couldn't do it and she pleaded. I started praying for the strength and the balls to do it. She died before I could help her. I couldn't do it. Moments later, she began breathing. I know now reflex. And I said I'll ask forgiveness later. And I tried CPR until I physically couldn't anymore. This was the final act of my chapter of failure. I failed as a father and I wasn't there to protect my children. The thing I blamed you most for and I'm no better. I failed as a husband. I wasn't able to fix Meg or find someone that could, and I wasn't able to succeed in CPR administration. Three times previously, I was a succession of patients, but that person that means the most to me, I failed on. So I wanted to die to be with my family, and I also felt I didn't deserve to live. After I cleaned up the kitchen, per request of Meg, I moved the children into our room, onto their mattress and comfortable sleeping positions onto a pillow, covered them for warmth and protection, and put a rosary in each of their hands. I put Zoe on the bed with us. I wanted to die, and I wanted my family to be together, not spread throughout the house. From there, I have little memory. Basically, I remember all the suicide attempts, yet another thing I sucked at, in puking up cheese, Benadryl, and stuffed cabbages. I thought was a sign from Meg. Supposedly, I had phone calls with people, text arguments with people, and my family was looking for me, amongst other things. I am ashamed, and I ask for forgiveness and understanding from them all. Other facts. After I was allowed to fall down the stairs, I was assisted the rest of the way to the bottom, where I encountered three voices. One, and I quote, we were looking to drop the charges, but we have to deal with this now. Second, we have a pod waiting for you with four other guys just like you. And I didn't know what pod was until March. And the third, which I thought was a UPS man, why didn't you answer the door when we were knocking? The last suicide attempt, I took four times the toxic dose of Benadryl. A lot. On Sunday, January 12th, evening. How Benadryl works is it slows down the body, thus slowing the metabolism of it. As anything that raises the heart rate happens, the more it metabolizes. Hence the sparse memory. At the hospital, at the hospital, I was deemed not able to sign intake paperwork. But somehow, I could wave my rights one hour after. I was in need of a guardian to sign my discharge paperwork, but was able to sign away my Miranda rights one hour later. The interrogation was timed greater than three hours, but only one hour was recorded. I asked for my attorney at the hospital when asked. Someone showed up and said to answer the questions asked, and he said he would meet with me after DC. My two interviews are conflicting with each other and conflicting with medical examiner autopsy reports that were done in between. The officer states this in his DD-5 that he called the ME prior to the second interview saying the report and my testimony did not show up. The second was more about my attempts than anything. I stated that I wanted to kill myself right there during my second interview, and yet somehow sound mind. First interview, I told them Megan's father committed suicide in 2002 or 2003, but somehow they came down to assist in the miscarriage in 2018. We didn't deal with her mother since 2007. 
The Medicaid fraud was and is BS. After I read the paperwork when they left, I found out the time frame was from when Meg took over the billing. I told her not to worry when I saw her Friday night, and I would keep her name out of it, as they were only talking probation at worst. I don't know the scope of billing mistakes, as my attorney said not to discuss it. Also, the FBI had red flags because they found out I traveled on days and I wasn't there. PTs were billed under me. That was the way the billing company set it up. All the therapists were credentials, but we billed as a group, and I owned the group. In addition, they were insinuating some sort of money laundering scheme, because no one does as much community services as you report. I told them to stick it up their asses, because I actually did more anonymously like donation to charities and help people with their rent, etc. I was supposed to meet with the attorney Wednesday after Thanksgiving and return to Florida for an early Thursday morning MD appointment for Meg. That was long awaited. I woke up Sunday morning to the smell of something burning. It was Meg burning journal entries she had written about her aunt and uncle, and she didn't want them to be read then, as she was saying the world was going to end and she was going to die, etc. I canceled going back to Connecticut for a week because of the red flags, and kept her under watch until we were to go to the medical appointment Thursday. I found out at 11.30 p.m., Wednesday night that she had already canceled that appointment in the week because she didn't want meds and no one could help. I then asked her to call one of the doctors in Gainesville as we had already moved Christmas to coincide with Tyler's birthday because of the sickness and we could visit a temple in Gainesville she wanted to go to as we were heading there for Tyler's birthday dinner. I only remembered about the investigation of Medicaid fraud when they showed me the newspaper article you called The Current about. That was shown to me in March. It was the first time I learned that I was facing one, two years of jail time in Connecticut. I was allowed to openly fly to Florida, and I kept in contact with them over the phone. It was when I went silent because of my suicide attempt that they decided not to come and get me. I was described as psychotic on my arrival to jail by the head of mental health counseling, and I do not remember most of the hospital time, any of the police station visit, or the first five to seven days here in jail. Yet somehow, I was competent enough to make a statement. My attorney made mincemeat of the prosecutor in our first pretrial last week. And now they are going after suppression of the statement. We have been limited due to coronavirus. They have rescheduled pre-trial for December 10th, 2020, and trial for January. But my attorneys are going to move it up to October once they figure out how jury selection is going to work because of corona. The main quote-unquote motive the prosecution is using is financial, and I just give up. All BS. Meg took care of the finances, and all I know is they were good. We had credit card debt that was budgeted and planned to be paid off from January 2020 to June 2020, and we had two business loans that were to be paid off in the beginning of January and March. Other than that, we had the mortgage for the condo at Wells Fargo. I only know the username and password Meg handled. The house rental we were evicted from for not paying December and January. Office rental, same as the house rental and payroll. To my understanding, all was paid through December. I didn't micromanage her. I trusted her, even when we had financial problems. I have family that would help, and I wasn't opposed to working harder. I have to do so to finish paying college as my father lost his job. I never whined about it then, I just worked harder and more. We had just invested money into rebuilding our website and marketing, and it was succeeding in less than a month. We had record of ales, new scheduled, and new staff I hired as well. Cancelled going back that first week, and the following week the same. I was giving my schedulers a heart attack. I was off the last of December for the holidays, and felt secure, as our AE was over 250k. No worries from what I know. Different from anyone else. Obviously, what he is saying here cannot be true. Not only because because he had already told the FBI that he had spent more money than he was making and was living above his means, but because many of his employees came forward about having their checks from Tony Bounce. Tony, as their boss, would have to have been made aware of this issue, in so much as his employees would be telling him directly that they weren't getting paid. The idea that they would go to Meg, who was living states away, is improbable, especially since she had stepped away from the business years prior. Tony was well aware of the financial straits he was in, and he was well aware that the FBI investigation wasn't just a mis- understanding. Meg couldn't be charging patients for visits they didn't go to. Meg couldn't have been the person the employees went to. All evidence that has been made public points directly to Tony being in sole control of the family's finances, while Meg was blissfully unaware. I hope that short letter answers most of the questions, as it's just a summary, believe it or not. We had an amazing marriage, only hampered by her sickness, that I accepted with open arms, as I was determined to find a cure for her. I am put here in protective, isolative custody to protect my case, and also for my protection. As they say, I am not jail material. Writing, reading, self-PT, calling my sisters and Uncle Martin, outlining my next book, and doing a framework of a non-profit that I am setting up in memory of my family, MATZB 2019, 
alive and at peace, dedicated to providing resources and services to the chronically ill, not just heart disease and cancer. I also work my case daily. I am looking forward to going home, whatever from and wherever that may be. I know I need to work on the name. So another reason I wrote is to offer forgiveness to you and extend a fragile olive branch. I don't know what kind of relationship I want with you or any. Time will tell. I offer you forgiveness for not being there to protect us that night. March 19th, 1980. Although we were both not there on respective nights in question for different reasons, I cannot forgive myself if I didn't forgive you. The happenings of that night in 1980 are not mine to forgive as I really don't know what happened and I don't really care at this point. I haven't dealt with you because I have my own independent views, formed by myself as I am an adult and allowed to, about the person you were and how I was shown off at the funeral of Aunt Gloria as a trophy despite telling you I didn't wish to be ahead of time. I also thought you were a pompous, narcissistic ass and I didn't want to have a relationship with you. There it was said. I am extending a fragile olive branch between you and I. That is all. Do not share any info with Uncle Martin or anyone else except for Danielle. Not even that I wrote you. I'm going to close for now as I am in extreme pain and I'm sure you're tired of reading. Please, if you correspond, watch what you write as they scan and send the new and prosecution all my mail. As of December 2021, the trial is just beginning, with Tony's defense arguing that the FBI investigation and his confession being admissible in this trial. But as this continues on, the world is left to wonder why this happened. How could a man who had everything going for him turn around and kill his entire family? How could a man so beloved by his community, his family, and everyone he met turn around and take the lives of the people he purported to care for the most? Was it because of the money and the fact that he was being investigated by the FBI? What could make a man do this? Regardless, these murders have forever shattered the facade that surrounds Celebration Florida. Before, what was thought as a near-utopian society built by people at Disney is forever connected to this heinous crime, and that is a stain that will never wash out. We here at Dreading want to thank Fiverr for sponsoring our channel. Fiverr is a helpful site that helps us streamline our creative process by putting us in contact with people who are skilled in areas that we are not. Their platform is filled with experts on every subject, and their prices are incredibly reasonable, with many choosing not to cost any more than $5. We have used them for everything, from audio editing, graphic design, and the script for this video was edited and reviewed using one of their very helpful creators. Whether you want to start your own YouTube channel and don't know where to start, or if you just need help with your homework, you can find what you were looking for on Fiverr. If you are interested in checking Fiverr out and seeing what you can do, use our link in the description box down below for a sweet treat. HTTPS colon backslash backslash go dot Fiverr.com backslash visit backslash question mark BTA equals 329322 and brand equals Fiverr CPA. We'll see you next time.